Everybody. So glad to see you all this week and thank you for joining me. So this week's topic is not a light one, and I know we don't really discuss light topics here, but this one really got to me. We're going to be discussing the murder of Junko Furuta. I want to preface this with a warning because we're going to be discussing the graphic things that this poor girl went through. She was held captive for 40 days of pure hell, where she was tortured until her body just physically couldn't take it anymore. I had to take breaks on reading into this case because it's just brutal, but a viewer did ask me to cover it, and I feel it's important because honestly, there was no justice for her or her family, and it's just, it's important to not forget Junko. Also, Guys, this case is from Japan, so I'm going to do my best with pronunciations for names and places with the help of videos, so don't drag me too hard if it doesn't sound right. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Junko Furuto was born on January 18th, 1971 in Masato, Japan. Junko was a 17-year-old who attended Yashio Manami High. She was intelligent, pretty, and well-liked by her classmates. She avoided the stereotypical teenage rebellion, such as drinking or smoking, and just focused on her studies. She worked a part-time job as well after school and used it as a means to save for the future. Junko had her sights on her post-graduation plans, which included a new job at an electronics store that she was very excited about. She wasn't going to let anything derail the path she was on, not even a relationship. Although Junko had boys who were interested in her, she was more interested in her future. But the denial of one boy would be just the beginning of her nightmare. Hiroshi Miyano was a classmate of hers who was a known bully in the school. No one dared oppose him and definitely didn't turn him down. Not in fear of a beating, but because it was known Hiroshi had connections to the Yakuza. If you don't know the Yakuza, they're a criminal organization in Japan, similar to the Mafia, and the people knew better than to get tangled up with them, and Hiroshi didn't take no for an answer. On November 25th, 1988, Junko left her job and began biking home. Unbeknownst to her, Hiroshi Miyano and his friend Nobuharu Minato were out for a bit of ultraviolence against anyone they could find. And unfortunately, about 8.30 p.m., she rode by the pair without noticing them. Hiroshi decided Nobuharu would be the distraction, so he made him run by and kick her off her bike. Hiroshi watched from across the street, pretending to just be a concerned bystander, when he rushed over to offer her a hand and walk her home. Junko didn't suspect a thing and accepted his kind gesture, but she never made it home. This was just the beginning of what would become 40 days of straight torture and assault, held captive against her will by four boys she went to school with. Her captors were Hiroshi Miyano, Nobuharu Minato, Joe Agora, and Yasushi Wantanabe. Hiroshi led Junko to an abandoned warehouse. She was confused but followed him, and once inside, he revealed that those rumors about him were true. He was connected to the Yakuza and didn't appreciate her rejection. Because she wouldn't let him have her, he forced himself on her. Junko was sexually assaulted and he threatened to not only kill her, but her family as well if she made a sound or tried to escape. Hiroshi then carried her to a nearby park where his three partners lay waiting. The group had a history of sexual assault, but usually let their victims go, but for some reason this time was different. They all assaulted the poor girl before deciding it hadn't been enough, and they smuggled Junko into the home of Nobuharu's family. This home became the gang's unofficial hideout and Junko's prison. Junko's parents contacted the police when she didn't return home, but the boys were already ahead of them. To avoid police intervention, they made Junko call her parents and tell them she was running away, but she was safe with a friend and to not come looking for her. They also forced her to cut off the investigation with the police. 
Nobuharu's family noticed the girl around the house, and to avoid prying, Junko was forced to act as his girlfriend. But as time went on and wounds became more noticeable, his parents knew that it wasn't the case. On multiple occasions, she begged for their help, but they refused. His family knew about the Yakuza connections and feared for their lives, so rather than go to the police, they turned a blind eye. Junko hoped complying with their demands would end in positive results, but unfortunately, it was just the beginning of her unimaginable pain. As mentioned, Junko was held for 40 days in which she was beaten, tortured, and sexually assaulted. Not only did the four boys continually assault her, but they also invited at least 100 other boys to come and hurt her as well. Reports speculate Junko was sexually assaulted over 400 times. She was also subjected to embarrassing acts of body hair shaving, forced to touch herself in front of them, and also made to dance naked. Another cruel form of entertainment they used was inserting random objects into both her genitals and anus. These things included scissors, bottles, hot light bulbs, and even a lit firework. This practice happened so much that Junko's organs suffered severe trauma and she eventually lost control of her urinary system and bowels. They left Junko naked and often made her sleep on the balcony despite it being the winter. She was subjected to other forms of torture as well, such as being forced to eat live cockroaches, drinking her own urine, being hung from the ceiling and used as a punching bag, having dumbbells dropped on her stomach, being beaten with various objects, being stuck in a freezer for hours, smashing her face into the cement floor, and even removing one of her nipples with a pair of pliers. She was also often burned with cigarettes, lighters, and hot candle wax. The boys refused to feed her anything but small amounts of food and eventually only gave her milk. Junko's nose had been so badly damaged, it consistently bled and she was only able to breathe from her mouth. By the end of December, she was so malnourished and suffered such extreme injuries that she was unable to make it downstairs to the bathroom. It would take her over an hour to crawl there and she eventually just quit trying and started soiling herself. 20 days into the torture, Junko managed to call the police, but before she could even stutter a sound, one of her captors hung up the phone. As punishment, they covered her legs and feet in lighter fluid and set them on fire, then burned her eyelids with lighters and smashed all of her fingers. She almost received help another time when a boy was invited over to the house. He went home after seeing Junko state and told his brother, who then told their parents. The police were tipped off about the mistreatment of this young girl, so they went to the Minato residence to perform a wellness check. The family acted surprised and assured them that they would notice if a girl was being tortured, and even offered for them to come inside and check. Police decided the gesture was enough to prove innocence and left. Junko knew by this point she wasn't making it out of this alive and just begged for them to end her life, but they wouldn't. On January 4, 1989, Hiroshi challenged her to a game of mahjong and even in her state, she beat him. This angered him and as a result, Junko received the last beating she would ever have to endure. They punched and kicked her insistently, followed by dousing her in gasoline and lighting her on fire. They allowed it to burn just enough so she wouldn't die from it. After she was put out, they kicked her over and over until she fell into a stereo and collapsed. She began to experience seizures, which they thought she was faking. They attacked her for two hours before Junko succumbed to her wounds. After they found she had died, they began to panic. None of them wanted to be charged with murder. They brainstormed until they came up with a way to get rid of the body. The group chose to place Junko in a 55-gallon drum and then fill it with cement. On January 5th, 1989, they began executing the plan. Junko was so badly damaged and infected, the murderers had to wear bags on their hands to avoid touching pus and DNA. Around 8 p.m., Junko was sealed in a drum and abandoned in Koto, Tokyo. All seemed to be clear and the boys just carried on. 
On January 23, 1989, Hiroshi and Joe were arrested on a sexual assault charge involving another girl. While interrogating Hiroshi, police mentioned an open murder investigation which sent him into a panic. Hiroshi thought police knew about Junko. He thought Joe must have confessed everything to save himself. But, funny enough, this wasn't the case. He unwittingly turned himself and his accomplices in, and within days, all of them were in custody. He told police exactly where to find Junko's body, which was recovered. She was positively identified through fingerprint analysis. An autopsy was performed on the body, which revealed her brain had shrunk and eardrums were severely damaged, but this was just the surface of the many injuries revealed. Despite the severity of the crime, all four boys received very light sentences due to them being considered juveniles at the time of the crime. Hiroshi was 18, Joe 17, Nabuharu 15, and Yasushi 16. Some, however, speculate it was due to gang connections. All four pled guilty to the charge of committing bodily injury that resulted in death. Junko's parents had to endure all the grisly details of their daughter's 40 days in hell. Spectators fainted and her mother had to undergo intense psychological treatment. By July 1990, the trials had commenced and all sentences were handed. Hiroshi Miyano was sentenced to 17 years initially. He submitted an appeal with the hopes of a reduced sentence, but instead received an additional three years. Nabuharu Minato was given four to six years, but was extended to five to nine. Yasushi Watanabe was given three to four years, but was extended to five to seven. And Joe Agora received eight years and did not try to appeal. Currently, all men are out of prison for the murder of Junko Furuta. All but one of them have reoffended for various other crimes, with some of them even changing their names. The Furutas received no justice for their daughter, but did win a civil suit against the Manatos since the crimes occurred in their home and they were aware. They were required to pay $425,000 in restitutions to the family which Junko's parents received zero of. The Minatos sold their home but ended up giving the money to three of the boys when they were released. Hiroshi's mother allegedly desecrated Junko's gravesite, believing she was the reason her son's life was ruined. Junko Furuta was finally laid to rest on April 2, 1989. In honor of her memory, Junko's parents were given the uniform from her dream job she was starting, and also her high school diploma symbolizing the dedication Junko had made to her future and as a reminder that she would never be forgotten. Like I said, this one was a tough one to research. I found myself just taking breaks, which isn't really common for me. I'd never heard about Junko's case prior to this, and her family deserves some form of justice. I'm glad they have answers, but at the same time, I can't imagine what it feels like to know your daughter's murderers are out walking the streets, living their lives, and she's no longer here. I don't know, guys. It's it's just really sad. But, as always, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below, and we can chat. If you found the video informative, leave a thumbs up and let YouTube know the content is interesting. And lastly, subscribe if you're into that sort of thing, as this will just keep you up to date on future uploads. Thank you friends for hanging with me once again. I know this one was tough, but these cases are important as well. Your continued support means the world to me. You're all the best. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.